Oh, there it is. Good morning. Good morning, good morning. There's a buzz as we come in and celebrate the civic holiday. Getting photos made in the narthex and having fun and we are celebrating good things in our midst. Thank you for being here today. I do this joke every year. Some people get it, some people don't. Because you're here today, your football team will win. Show of hands for the Rams. Show of hands for the Rams. Show of hands for the Bengals. Show of hands for people who don't care. There you go. There's a football game today. Yeah, Paul, there's a football game. Here is I a picture no of your generosity in action. This is a picture of our new sunshade on the playground. And so the kids now have a beautiful space. We cleared out a lot of the trees. It's phen phenomenal. And, and eventually we think we're going to have to move that fence to a wooden fence. The wind keeps blowing it down as we've put up sort of a divider so the kids have a nice view of the sky versus the, the top of buildings. But it really is lovely and it looks great. And that's in part because of your generosity. You make things like that happen without us incurring any debt. So we're excited about that. Today we continue in the Revelation series. And today's topic is the Antichrist. Very light topic on Football Sunday. And yeah. So it's interesting. The number 666 gets talked about a lot. I'll mention it today. Yeah. There's a number that doesn't, which is 668. Do you know what that is? Paul, Paul I, I, I hesitate to ask. What is the number 668? That's the neighbor of the beast. Yeah. The neighbor of the beast. Wow. Six, yeah. <laughs> See? See? That wasn't me. That was him. <laughs> Welcome to worship. Let us come into God's presence and turn our thoughts to God alone through the prelude. Good morning. Good morning. Let us stand and continue our worship uh, as we sing the intro. It. Him who is 
and who was and who is um, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him, glory and the dominion forever and ever. Let us embrace the revelation of God. Let us worship the Lord who reigns forever. Amen. service, that we go before God, confessing our shortcomings, confessing our failings, seeking forgiveness from the God who created the entire universe. So please, join me in the prayer of confession, <coughs> first silently, and then together. Let us pray. God of salvation, we admit we are drawn to convenience and comfort, enjoying the good news about Jesus, while avoiding the deep commitments to call us to be Christ. We care for ourselves too much, forgetting the needs of others until a convenient opportunity to help arise. Forgive us, help us to repent, and make us whole again. Through the revelation and the truth we find in your word. Amen.
assurance of God's faithfulness from the Apostle Paul. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Friends, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks be to God.
Amen. We've got a few children here today, so if you'll come forward, we'll have a little quick time together, and it's going to be quick, it's going to be fun. Come on up. We've got a few here today. All right, great. Before you go to your time, Jimmy Chase. Hello, ladies, ladies. Hello, 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 hello. Hello, hello, hello. Looking great. Ooh, sparkly today again. I love it. I love it. It reminds me of what I've been watching, the uh, ice skaters. You know, they wear a lot of sparkly things and everything. She's got a little jewelry on. Turn around so everyone can see your thing. Do you mind? She's got on her forehead there. It's lovely. Looking great. You know, oh, and sparkly shoes. Thank you for pointing that out. The reason I'm mentioning it, how many of you guys this week, this week, somebody has said something nice to you? Most everybody? Most, you think? Is it harder to remember nice things or bad things? Nice. Number two, you think it's harder to remember? It's harder to remember? That's good. You know, I think that it's very important that your church says something to you. See, here's my promise to you. We're going to be real quick today. Anybody who ever tells you, I hope you're looking at me. This is important. This is one of the few times I'll say, like, this is really serious because I love to laugh. And we have fun on Wednesday night. And I want you to laugh. I play my guitar. It's silly. This is serious. Anybody ever tells you that you are anything other than a child of God, beautiful, handsome, and smart, they are lying. And you come and tell me, and I will say something to them. Anyone ever says anything ugly to you about who you are, you come and tell me. Because part of my job and everybody's job here is to remind you that you're a child of God. And you know, in the Olympics, we cheer on all of our ice dancers and skaters. I was watching the ice dancing last night. Fabulous outfits. Fabulous. I wanted the orange jumpsuit so bad. <laughs> but we cheer them on, right? They're just athletes. You guys are children of God. And so we're going to do something fun today when you go for your time for kids. And this is not to be embarrassing. It's for fun. They're going to act like you are our champions. And they're going to cheer you on as you make your way back there. So they're going to all stand, and they're going to act like you're making a run, like down the alpine slopes, or you're getting your award. And they're going to look at you, and they're going to cheer and clap. Do you know why? It's their job. One day, that's your job. When you're old enough, you're going to have to do the same thing for the next generation. Because anyone who tells you anything other than that is lying. And you come and tell me. You are a child of God, and it's our job to remind you of that. Because you're our champions for Christ. So... Stand up, and would everyone stand up? Let's practice. You're going to go right down the middle. Go to your, Let's give them a round of applause. There they go. Woo. Wow. So good. So good. Very good. So good. You know, Paula, this year's crop of children, this year's crop of children, they're really breaking some world Olympic records in kids' ministry this year. Would you agree, Paul? They're really breaking some records. Turn and greet somebody, everybody, and give yourself some love, too. Turn and greet somebody.
Please be seated. Friends, our text this morning comes to us from the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verses 11 through 18. Hear now the word of God. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all the authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. The calls for wisdom, let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and that number is 666. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A little right, light reading on Sunday. So simple and clear. The Antichrist as a term is not mentioned in Revelation. It actually comes from medieval texts that were written to sort of supplement our thoughts about this figure described in the New Testament. We're going to dive right in, and I'm going to give you an image to go with the review from last week. Here's an image that I found that is obviously symbolic to somebody. <clears throat> I don't know what it means. But it would be as if I said around a poem that there was this time in our midst when it felt like God was speaking to me, and I saw these hands holding these three stars, which were symbolic of, and then I went on this deep sort of diatribe about what I felt like God was communicating to me, and then generations from now, somebody read that and said, what in the world is that statue out front of your church with the three stars? And you were like, ah, I, you know, it's hard. I know it was about God, and we're doing the best we can to interpret it. This is a lot of what's in Revelation. It's worth reading. It is unlike any other New Testament letter. So a quick review of what I said last week, three things. It's a letter, it's prophecy, and it's apocalyptic. Can you say those three words with me? Letter, prophecy, apocalyptic. The first two are easy. Letter. You and I write letters. It would be as if Paul wrote a letter to me, and Paul, in Christian love, was giving me some advice. And he said, Brian, I've noticed on Sundays you're, again, he points out something specific to me. It's a letter to me written in private that then you get a copy of. And he's saying something, you know, Brian, you need to dress up a little bit more on Sunday. I've noticed you coming in on shorts under the robe. It's too casual. And it's very specific and pointed advice. It's not done to be ugly. It's just a piece of advice. But then you get that letter without seeing my response and go, well, I guess we should not. We shouldn't wear shorts, or what, what do we take from this? We're reading a letter to seven churches. Anyone who forgets that should put you on high alert, as if the letter is written to you out of context. All of the New Testament needs to be done this way. The letters are written to particular audiences, either a church or a person. Revelation is that, but it is also prophetic. It is a prediction of things to come soon, also easy to grasp. It's a letter in a particular time and place, still has meaning for us. But we have to decontextualize it, and then it's prophetic. We don't do a lot of this, so it's already odd to us. But then thirdly, it's apocalyptic literature. This is confusing. We have no modern examples of apocalyptic literature that are authoritative for the church, so we're doing the best we can to read something that is 
complicated, lots of symbols, lots of imagery. It's a vision given to Jesus Christ, then to an angel to give to John. It's an interpretation of an interpretation. It's complicated. Still with me, Sam? Still here. It's the setup and where we've been. But I want to answer one thing that came up last week, because I like to answer questions. Miracles. Because I made the case, and I've been doing this in our Sunday school class, that I am of the camp that what this prophecy was about came to pass. So a lot of the Left Behind books, they're very entertaining. They're not relevant to me. I think it's an interpretation of something that's misinterpreted because, again, they're reading the letter as if it's for people in 2021 or 20 or 15, whenever that book was written. Forget, well, what about the people that came before us? It, what does it mean to them? It's taken out of context, but because I demystified so much of it, it invited somebody to ask, which I was flattered they would ask, well, do you believe miracles occurred? What about the Gospels that talk about Jesus healing people, walking on water? Is, are the Gospels apocalyptic? They are not. They are not written the same way, and so therefore, I read the Gospels in a different way than I read Revelation. I do think miracles occurred. I have no problem talking about healing and things that are supernatural. So I'm reading the Bible book by book with it as a story, but always looking at who the audience was and what type of writing it is. The Gospels are different from the New Testament letters. You're still with me, Sam? I'm still here. You see where I'm going? You gotta think. You gotta think. This is not a book to pop open and make a magnet about the number of the beast and stick it on your refrigerator and say, I hope someone's not putting a little barcode on my hand. It's all out of context. So let's pray. Let's do a little bit more background research and then get to the text today, not to demystify it, because much of this can't be discerned. It was written to a particular group of people in a style that we don't read anymore, but to get to something practical that we can do. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, come and illuminate us to the truth that we would know what you are communing to each one of us, communicating to us by way of your word, by you directly, Holy Spirit. May we have a supernatural encounter that inspires us to obedience, that no matter where we land on the scale and spectrum of beliefs about this particular letter, we are all in agreement. It calls us to follow the Son to deny that which is evil and to rebuke it and to speak truth and life that glorifies Jesus. Help us find solid footing, Holy Spirit, as we listen with our hearts and minds today. In dependence upon you for understanding, Holy Spirit, we pray. And all of God's people said, here are the scriptural references that talk about a figure collectively now referred to as the Antichrist. It is also referred, this person is a person, it's a person, uh, the man of perdition, the man of lawlessness. The main thing is that these all give us collectively the sources of the movies that you see about the second coming, the rapture, and the end of the world as these artists interpret it. This is where it comes from for Christians. That in First and Second John, in those two books, we have references that talk about this figure. We have it in Second Thessalonians and, of course, in Revelation. But it's all really rooted in the next slide, the book of Daniel, written about 167 years before the birth of Jesus. It references this final persecutor who would, and here's a quote from the text, speak against the Most High and then with alterations in times and laws. And you see this come up in Revelation, references to Daniel and Ezekiel, these prophetic inferences from Scripture itself. Everybody still here? Say, I'm still here. It's about as far as I'm going to go into detailed stuff. If you come to the Sunday School class, I'll give you the last two weeks of handouts that you can take home and read that are scholastic verified interpretations in my mind. They're not just off the internet. They're good material, and you'll have more material in depth about the Antichrist. So I want to just put this sign up as a reminder. This is a picture of someone going into the water, and notice the sign. Shark sighted today. Enter water at own risk. Brothers and sisters, should you ever go to the beach 
and there is a lifeguard with a warning out that there have been shark sightings. I say this in Christian love. Don't go in the water. (laughs) Most of the attention about this is given in Australia because you have the graphic shark attacks that do a lot of damage. The animals are big. But most shark attacks occur in Florida because there's more people in the water and there are a ton of sharks. I grew up surfing. I saw them all the time. Always terrified me. Always terrified me. I mean, screams. You'd be in the water and you'd hear people screaming. You know, there's a shark. And you just, oh, what do I do? Don't go in the water if you're not prepared. If you're going to read Revelation, don't read it naively. Prepare yourself. Do a little study. Find the context. Get a Bible that's recommended with nice study notes on it. And when people start jumping into the 21st century and naming antichrists, get out of that water. Because that's crazy talk. And to, to put it more bluntly, Christians have always done this. In the medieval times, there were Christians, well-meaning Christians, who said, well, we've only got a few references here. Hey, let's fill in the gaps. These are well-known writers. And they named Antichrist, and they sort of distinguished between capital A, the big one, and little ones. For example, Mussolini was named an Antichrist by a large group of Christians when he emerged. There's one. Not so much. There is a reference to the Pope by none other than Martin Luther, the founding of our faith. Christians get this wrong all the time. If you hear somebody naming the Antichrist in the coming of Jesus, run. Don't go in those waters. I say that in Christian love. And if I'm wrong and Jesus comes again, you'll be ready anyways. Can I get an amen? Follow Jesus, you'll be fine. This is confusing stuff. Let's look at it again and not demystify all of it. I am no Revelation scholar, but we can grab certain phrases and glean certain things that invite us to study for the purpose of faith. Let's look at the text again. Then I saw another beast, and there was a first beast. So people often, when they make movies about this stuff, they talk about the Antichrist, and they forget there are actually two beasts listed in Revelation. It's apocalyptic literature. If you're already starting to feel the crazies coming on like this, this, does, this just sounds weird. It's apocalyptic literature. We don't read it. It's symbolic. There was a beast of the sea, reference in Revelation. There was a beast of the earth listed in Revelation. We then take the New Testament texts and get this idea of there was a figure in history that early Christians identified as a major opponent of Jesus. That's where I land, not with trying to find this figure, this second beast, today. Because if I were to do that, who would you choose from? One of the Russian czars was called the Antichrist, in addition to Mussolini. It's just throughout history, people have tried to make sense of it by saying, it's our time. It hasn't happened yet. We go a little further. This is this person performs great signs for the purpose of deception. Now hold that thought, because I'm going to make the case today. And again, it it upsets many people. I am of the ilk that we know who this person was in history, that this has already come to pass. I'll tell you who I think it was, and if you're uncomfortable and you want to come up to me and tell me it was some recent president or something like that, I will look at you and love you and just go, when you turn around, go, oh my God. No offense. I say that in Christian love so I can say anything. (laughs) This figure in history performed great signs. This was common to do if you were in authority. You would spread lies about yourself. And remember, there's no way to verify this stuff. People grew up thinking these were semi-godlike figures. You would just write mythical poems about yourself. I mentioned in today's class, if you think it doesn't happen... There is a figure now in the East, in a closed system, who does this about himself, projecting things that are lies in a closed society to elevate his authority. So this is not outlandish. 
for a person in history to make these kinds of claims, to rule by fear and mythological weirdness. We go a little further. This person would claim certain things, but, and here we get where all the movies come from. This vision to John, he, just, he says, he, he writes, Jesus got a vision of things to come. An angel gave me, John, that vision, and in that vision, what was communicated to me that this Antichrist would not allow anyone to shop, survive in society. I've, you see I've got the little, ask, the little parentheses, I'm truncating it. You couldn't survive in society if you had some type of identification ascribing loyalty to this figure. That's what the vision was. Now, this then became the number of the beast, and it, again, the number is a man, this number is 666. You see it in green there. Now again, it can't be verified. But if a person is writing an apocalyptic literature, they're going to use a lot of code. And one of the theories, and I'll be candid before I say who it is, I just do this because it's easier. Can I get an amen? It's just easier. I don't want to go through history thinking, oh, there's the Antichrist. It's that person. This is easier for me. My mind can come around it. That number, when you alliterate it in the original language to a name, is Nero. This was a person writing about Nero. He did horrible things. He persecuted Christians. There was a Caesar before Nero. Beast number one, beast number two. A lot of these things line up. If you think it's nuts, go find another nuts theology that you like about this. But know this. There is something important that we can all agree on. Behind the vision and the letter to these seven churches, it's a letter to seven churches, is a critique of faithfulness when things get tough. There's a critique. Now that you and I can land on. You and I can do this today. We can take a look in the mirror and say, in certain situations, have I missed what this is about? This week, there were a couple things that happened. I want to show you this picture of just a symbol here, a hand holding a light bulb. And I want you to keep that up for just a second, Griffin, because there's an image behind it. On the one hand, there's this hand holding a light bulb. I was studying and reading this a lot this week, and the office now is in cycles of busy days and slow days. We just have some days when there's just a bunch of people here, and there's days when it's really quiet, just people are sick or out, you know, and, and you kind of feel these rhythms. Some days I have to answer the door a lot. Uh, people have been here helping out Mabry, who's on maternity leave, who normally gets the door. It was a quiet day. I came in on Thursday, and I'm reading this and feeling pretty confident in Brian's own understanding of this and confident about where I was going about applying it in daily life. I walk out into the back to sort of drink in the victory of the playground, the little sunshade, to see what it's like early in the morning because that's when kids will be enjoying it on Sunday morning. Still with me, Sam? I'm still here. So I'm back there kind of, you know, I'm not patting myself on the back, but I'm, I'm having a good Brian day. I look in the back, and there's a gentleman sleeping on one of our tarps. And Paul has made some tarps. He's pulled a tarp down. And the, I mean, after all this about following Jesus, Revelation isn't about all these nutso things. It's about practical things. I can feel myself getting upset. Now, this person has pulled down a tarp, and here we are on the back. It gets better. You know, I'm in a tither. Oh, what, what do I do? Oh, you know, I can't get my thoughts together. So I call Mabry, I'll call Jesse. What do we normally do? Well, you know, we call the police and gently ask them to come and just not arrest the person, just escort them off the property. So I do that. Officer comes. I say, hey, I don't want to get him in trouble. Should I confront these people in the past? I said, no, because sometimes they're violent. It's better just to call us, and we won't arrest them. Okay, so the police officer's in the back. He comes and gets a person. I come back in, and I'm trying to be nice. I'm looking through the window, right? I'm looking at the person. He gets up, and he's, you know, he's intoxicated or something. He's kind of putting himself together, and he sees me through the window. So I, you know, wave like, hey, I'm about to go out. And he looks at me, and he waves, and then he kind of goes over, and he, he's going to get his bicycle, and then he realizes he's got to go to the bathroom because he opens the gate to go into the shed and go to the bathroom. Now I'm really losing my mind. I can't think, of course. Now, he's being polite in his mind. Hey, I don't want to go to the bathroom in front of you. I'll just use the shed here. I'm all discombobulated. 
he comes around, and I, I try and catch him, and it, it, it finally catches up to me to say, the next time, if you want to come in and use the bathroom, treat him like a human being. I missed all that. All that. The whole time, I'm like, our sunshade. I'm going to have to clean this up. That's antichrist thinking, by the way. That's antichrist thinking. Not being able, when you see something you haven't seen, to initially get it right. All I got right that day was I told the police officer, if you can help it, please don't arrest him. Don't treat him indecently. But when I had to confront it, just couldn't do it. See, we're all in the camp of antichrists on some days. I may not be the big antichrist who's overtly telling you to worship other things, but when it comes to the basics, sometimes we all fail. And it happened again. Someone came to the office asking for help. Now I'm ready. I've got Brian. I know what to do. I'm going to be nice and polite, and it starts out nice and polite, and the person gets belligerent. It's just, it's hard to be faithful to Christ in every circumstance because people are difficult. I'm difficult. You're going to have to deal with me on some days, and you're going to have to be Christ-like when I'm not at my best. Can I get an amen? Likewise, the same. Christian community comes down to basic, simple things. Treating people like they're human beings and they're not garbage. Treating people like they deserve to be loved when they're not having their best day and you don't know their whole story. You see, this image that's real clear in the front, in the back, is a picture of the new telescope in outer space. Oh, the buildup. We're sending a rocket ship to space. 50 gazillion dollars. It's going to be amazing. That's the first picture. I'm like, yeah, no, not so much. This is Christianity. It's sometimes hazy when you read the text. You can't, what are, what are these horns, beasts? What, what are these things? I don't know all the answers of all the symbolism, but I know what's clear. I know what's clear. Jesus stands with us through trials and tribulations. Jesus calls us to faith in trials and tribulations. No matter who's in power, no matter who's over you, no matter what you're going through, Jesus calls us to faithfulness. So we land with some questions today. I hope they're simple. Picture of a question mark that's glowing through this blurred telescope. Who is Jesus calling you to become today? Who is he challenging you to be today in faithfulness to him, is there a person who hates your guts that Jesus is calling you to pray for? Is there a wound on your soul that just never quite mended? You don't talk about it anymore, but whenever it comes up, you just kind of avoid it. Is there some practice of spirituality that you haven't been embracing? Quiet time with the Lord in the morning to hear his voice that comes over time, as a presence that reassures. Revelation is confusing. We don't have apocalyptic literature. We don't know how to interpret a prophecy. It's confusing for me. But it still calls us to the same practices that Christ said himself. Follow me. Honor God. Remember the promises of God. Love others radically who don't deserve it. This is the message of Revelation. We'll move into the next two weeks with more practical things to think about. I invite you to the Sunday school class to get the papers to read on your own and to ask questions, to be okay where there's not a clear interpretation of a passage you read in this book. The overwhelming thing is faithfulness to Christ, and we can all do that. Lord, speak to us in our own inadequacies of faith, that we would be challenged to grow in places where we are not clear what faithfulness looks like. Lord, we trust that Jesus stands with us in times of uncertainty and confusion. And we trust that the message of Revelation is still relevant. Whatever is to come, Jesus wins. Whatever has gone before us, Jesus has conquered that. Where there are inadequacies or unfaithful parts of our own daily habits and life and thinking, help us to be challenged to Christ-like thinking and behaving in response to our reading today. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen. Friends, let us stand, proclaim what we believe, using the words of the Apostles' Creed.
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, let us continue our time of worship as we go before God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, in this parched pandemic landscape where we have all been exiled into uncertainty and constant change, we find it difficult to send our roots into streams of your living waters. We are distracted, we are overwhelmed, going from one undone task, one fraught decision, one fresh worry to the next. We are like the deer panting for water. Our soul longs for you. You are divining rod, O oh God leading us to the spiritual streams of support that you so graciously provide. And God, in your perfect world, no sword is drawn except for the sword of righteousness. Be with those today, O oh God, who live in fear of war and violence, Bless those whose borders are threatened by a powerful enemy military. Gather all your people under the banner of peace, O oh God, so that we might come to know each other and to love each other, just as we have been called. May all rumors of war be dispelled favor of your path of truth, justice, and peace. God, who provides all we have, heal those who are held hostage to violence and threats of violence. Calm the traumatized, the victims, the oppressed, Ground those who find themselves helpless and spinning. Renew those who are weary and overwhelmed. Heal those who are suffering and sick. Love and comfort those who are grieving. Gather us together so that we can learn to be tender and merciful with one another, and with ourselves. United as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers to you, O oh God. Hear us now as we pray the prayer Christ taught us by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the God is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Now we come before God with our tithes and our offerings, and there is a connection card that you have today to update your information with us. If you're not getting the the weekly email, twice this week, let us know, and we'll update to connect with us as well, go on that card. Place it in the plate as it comes by, along with your gift to God today. Will the ushers come forward? offerings to build up your kingdom. We would ask that you use our lives and make us instruments of your peace, spreading the good news of the gospel here at home and throughout the world. Since we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I'd like to invite the elder and deacon being installed and ordained today to come forward.
Sam is here. Is Eileen here? Eileen's not here. All right. So come on up, Sam. We'll have some other elders come up for the laying on of hands. Uh, there are some technical questions we have to ask you, and there is no way to shorten this. So the answer is always when I say, will you, you say, I will. Or if I say, do you, you say, I do. Got it? All right. Sam's being installed as an elder. And we have Eileen Gasilio coming on as uh, a deacon. Uh, so I will ask just you these questions because everyone else has already asked these questions. Everyone else has already been installed. This is your first time as an elder, right? So we're going to have the laying on of hands today as well. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Do you? Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ and the church universal and God's word to you? Do you? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what Scripture leads us to believe? And do and will you be instructed and led by these confessions as you lead the people of God? Do you? Will you? Will you fulfill your ministry and obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? Will you? Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? Will you? Will you be, in your own life, a seeker of Jesus Christ's truth, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? Will you? Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? Do you? Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? Will you? This is specifically for any new elders, then we'll ask a question of the deacons. For, for you, will you be a faithful ruling elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, nurture, and service? Will you share in government and discipline, serving in councils of the church, and in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? For our deacons, will you be a faithful deacon, that's for you, teaching, charity, urging concern, and directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need. And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? Will you? Will all of you now do your part in responding to what has been set aside before we have the laying on of hands? Do we, the members of the church, accept Sam as a ruling elder and Eric as a deacon, chosen by God, through the voice of this congregation, to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ. Do we? Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? Do we? <clears throat> Having answered these questions, it is the time where we do the laying on of hands. So I'm going to invite specifically Sam to come forward. I'm going to invite any elders or deacons who are here to come forward for this process as well. Are you able to kneel on the steps? All right. Any elders formerly ordained, still that holds for life. And so this is the laying on of hands to set him aside for this office. And once this is done, it's once and done. You're an elder for life. Lord God Almighty, ruler of heaven and earth, before time began, you set aside this moment for Sam, that he would answer the call to serve as your elder, that he would say yes. Holy Spirit, fill Sam with wisdom, power, and love. Set aside Sam for this season of life, that from this day forward, he will know he has been chosen for this role and he will seek you first. Where there is disagreement among elders, may he speak his mind but seek to reconcile and find your will. Where there is uncertainty, may he seek certainty and call for patience until we hear clearly from you what is the right decision to make. May he be a steward of the resources people of this church have set aside for your divine purposes. May he see that every penny given is given an offering to you. Fill Sam with the knowledge and wisdom to know best what to do 
as a member of our session in this season. For the next three years, may Sam be blessed with good health. May he be blessed with all that you have to give your servants. Holy Spirit, come. Fill Sam with the best that you have for those who have been called and answered the call to serve in your church and specifically here at San Pedro. Holy Spirit, come and anoint Sam as an elder in your church. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord a big hand for Sam and for all of our deacons. After worship to greet him. Let's continue in our worship. Do stop and congratulate, affirm, and love our officers and know that they are called to serve the Lord on your behalf. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I hope you had an opportunity to get your portrait made. If not, stop by and see us afterwards. I'm sure we can make some arrangements. Absolutely. And now, friends, may the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, 
and the peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thank you.